Good afternoon and welcome. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. Indigenous people have been battling stereotypes, misunderstandings, and racism ever since contact. Every year, some 300,000 new people move to Canada as refugees or as immigrants. This week, we put the misinformation and ignorance that greets them in focus. And we'll talk to those working to stop it. It's timely as this is National Citizenship Week in Canada, and it's important that newcomers get off on the right foot with the first people of this land. We want you to join in the conversation, so our phone lines are open. Here's how you can call us toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in Focus. Before I introduce you to our guests, let's take a look back at a story that APTN did a little while ago for some background on today's subject matter. People talked in those days was... According to Canadian Race Relations Foundation, one in four Canadians have low or no trust in Aboriginal people. But the survey also says the closer Canadians live to Aboriginal people, the picture improves. The more uh, Canadians uh, had contact with Aboriginal peoples, uh, the more sympathetic they were to things like Idle No More. But oddly enough, that's not the case here in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. It's the only place where uh, higher, more frequent contact with Aboriginal peoples doesn't seem to have any effect on positive attitudes. In all, 1,800 people from across Canada were surveyed late last year and early this year. The foundations want to find out how attitudes were affected when round dances and that hunger strikes pushed Aboriginal issues to the limelight. Ron Swain is with the Congress of Aboriginal People. He doesn't like what the survey seems to be showing. The survey puts special emphasis on immigrants. When we arrived to Canada and you know, have a totally, um, um, don't have preconceived ideas of Aboriginal people, within two weeks develop negative attitudes towards Aboriginal people. Abdihi Ahmed grew up in Kenya. He now lives in inner city Winnipeg. He says he knew nothing about Aboriginal people before he came here and the immigration process didn't help. So they go through all orientation about Canada, a great country, multiculturalism, everybody welcoming, people of all colors, very little about Aboriginal communities. Ahmed says this leaves newcomers and regular Canadians to base their opinions by what they witness in the streets and see in the media. No understanding of Aboriginal culture, they don't understand their, their background and you know they have no appreciation of the colonial experience and the kind of issues that they have been to. Joining us now is Hani Atan Alubidi. He is the Community Engagement Coordinator for Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. He's been helping newcomers integrate into Winnipeg society for nearly 20 years. Thank you so much for joining me. So when you watch a video like that, uh, some comments people, people say, you know, within two weeks there's these negative comments, there's not enough that, are, that is given to people who are coming to this country. Uh, this, is, I'm, this is nothing new to you. Thanks, Melissa. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, listening to, to, to your words and also to the, what we just hear um, with respect to the ignorance and also lack of education and awareness of, um, about the indigenous people of the land, mm -hmm. it, it makes one um, very upset and also sad. And so our job at Immigration Partnership Winnipeg is to make sure that this is, these barriers to be removed and for education to find its own path mm -hmm. and the proper education, education that is culture appropriate and is the contents of that education should be um, given and provided by the indigenous communities themselves about themselves. Mm -hmm. And we are just facilitating the process for that to happen. And this never happened before. I mean, this didn't exist. People would come to this country and there's a lot of services to help uh, set them up to get them settled and whatnot. But there was nothing that was here to um, ensure that there's a, a relationship with the indigenous population. So this was your group who, who, who spearheaded this. That's right. And so we're trying to say if a newcomer comes to the city here and get an orientation on how they access banking, the banking system, education, going to school um, mm -hmm. or registering their kids to school, a um, uh, little uh, orientation about the legal system and the rest of it. But there is no much given about indigenous people. And if we think that there is a major need for that 
that education to be provided. And there's no much um, uh, information available for newcomers to learn about the indigenous people of this land mm -hmm. and to learn about their cultures and their diversity that exists within the community of the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is essential to create an orientation toolkit to educate newcomers from the start and to prevent stereotypes, misconception, and, um, um, and, and, and debunk myths Mm -hmm. and replace them with factual facts on, on the ground. What are some of the things that you had heard? You've been in this business 20 years. You must have heard, uh, and you can't shock me with it. You can't shock our viewers with some of the stuff you've heard, I assure you. But um, what are some of the things, the stereotypes, the negative perceptions? What, what do you hear from new Canadians? And particularly mm -hmm. Winnipeg is, has the largest urban uh, Aboriginal population in Canada. So really, you're seeing the, the front line of of when these groups meet, right? Right. So, uh, for example, one of the uh, one of the examples is with respect to housing. If people, uh, newcomers, let's say refugee, newly arrived refugees, come into the city, and you would offer them a rental unit somewhere in the inner city or North End, mm -hmm. you would probably face some resistance. They would not accept it, fearing that I don't want to be in that neighborhood because that's where the indigenous people live. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying all of them, but there's a yeah. very large number of them. And that's in itself, it's a barrier even for the service providers. And also, it's a barrier in terms of creating that welcome and inclusive society. You cannot exclude a big segment, which is a central segment of our society, which mm -hmm. is the indigenous people. And yeah. if you have that barrier that prevents the new from reaching the first, it is a problem. And the first, I mean the First Nations and the first uh, yeah. peoples of this land. So yes, there are, in terms of housing, in terms of um, even discrimination and racism, there is possibility to, mm -hmm. to obtain misinformation that develop awkward behavior towards your own neighbor that can be an indigenous person. And where and are they getting it from? Is it from, from the, the, the cultural group that is here that kind of welcomes them from whatever country they're coming from? It's, is it coming from, from there saying, hey, welcome to Canada and everything, but just so you know, you don't want to live over to by these people, or you got to watch out for these people. Is that where it's coming from? That's largely right. And so people, once they arrive here, they will get this ill-advised um, consultation, I would say, mm -hmm. coming from their either community members or the people that they meet on the street, mm -hmm. or the people that they uh, choose as friends. And it is very yeah. fast obtain information. It seems to me they, they just um, uh, get it very quick. Within a week or two, they start thinking and asking, please don't take us where they, where they don't even call them indigenous people. They say, native. we don't want to go to the where the native people are. Yeah. And to, so it, it, to me, it's a setback, it's a barrier, it's a problem, it needs to be dealt with. And I think the only way to remove barriers of ignorance is to use proper education mm -hmm. and awareness. And that is not in the place now. We don't have that. There's, it's interesting to me, too, that there's uh, a lot of the people who come from other countries to Canada are from colonized nations. Many of these people are themselves indigenous to where they came from and have seen the effects of colonization. Do you see a disconnect once they get here? There is disconnect. However, we discover that there is, it's easily to be, these, bridge, uh, these gaps can easily bridge by providing the space for both community members to come together and discuss the commonalities. Um, the example of that is on March 3rd, we had a forum where indigenous members uh, of our community here in Winnipeg and also the new, uh, new ethnocultural community members came together, all around 70 people. Mm -hmm. And we used the common uh, proud, uh, proud traditional part of their cultures, which is the oral history mm -hmm. and oral tradition, and also um, storytelling as a common ground and brought them together and they share a story. Mm -hmm. And if you see that both, both parts move together towards a solid understanding of each other. And so it is really ignorance and lack of information that mm -hmm. keep people apart. And when we brought them together, they connected. So that disconnect disappears right. when the education and awareness and empathy exist. Well, just the opportunity in a controlled space, somebody saying, hey, we're here to share and, and be open and get to know one another. Uh, I think that's interesting. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to know was, um, we, had, when we had discussed previously, there's a misconception about um, indigenous people have all this free housing and free, uh, what was it, free education. Mm -hmm. And so people can't, c can't comprehend, well, why am I seeing you impoverished or homeless? Yeah. Where does that in misinformation come from, too? Is, and is it as quick? Is it, with, is it within the first week or two they have that 
misconception as well? So m most of the service providing uh, organizations that provide or, uh, service to refugees or newcomers mm -hmm. are situated here in, in downtown. When newcomers arrive here to the city, they see, they look at the Central Park area and the surrounding area and they see the images what they see of the indigenous people and they think this is their culture, this is who they are mm -hmm. and that's what I should be staying away from. Um, and therefore, I hear that they got all the opportunities, they got the money, they got the access to education which is for free mm -hmm. and this and that and they chose to be in this case. Right. And that goes back to lack of education, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge about what exactly went wrong yeah. and why this, t this group of people ended up to be here, not here, mm -hmm. they don't have that. Well, most Canadians who are, and I would say, well, maybe I should pump the brakes on that, maybe not most Canadians, but a large chunk of Canadians believe those exact same things. Mm -hmm. They're born here. So, yeah. you know, the, the lack of education goes deep. It's not just specific to uh, newcomers, that's I think, for sure. I think as a society, we have a responsibility to make that disappear slowly and uh, gradually yeah. and surely. And I think the only way is to engage people in a proper manner and also provide them the tools. And this is, in this case, you need to provide education, proper education, knowledge, orientation um, that provide um, a straight pathway to inclusiveness mm -hmm. and to have a welcoming society based on the fact that we are all share the same space and to give that respect that indigenous people deserve. Mm -hmm. as the indigenous of this land. And you, your group has uh, taken a number of people from different ethno cultures and indigenous people and stuck them in various uh, mm -hmm. round tables, panels, advisory committees, and how is it working out? Well, tell me what they do. What, they, what did they do? So at the Immigration Partnership Winnipeg, we have a few sector tables, and one of them is dedicated for the uh, relationship between indigenous and the newcomers, and that table called Indigenous and the Newcomer Engagement Sector Table. Mm -hmm. uh, we have set of priorities to work on, and those priorities, and the focus or the main objective of that is to uh, bridge the gap, build bridges between the two communities, and also explore the common ground Mm -hmm. and uh, avoid the differences and try to bring both communities together on, um, um, through shared interest and recogni recognizing mutual concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this sector table is just one out of many and uh, some of the members um, you will be seeing today. Um, uh, some of them sit on the immigrant advisory table, some work on, uh, sit on the indigenous consultation circle mm -hmm. and the indigenous consultation circle that we created as a part of our uh, organizational structure is to give us the proper advice and to review the contents of every project that has to do with indigenous people mm -hmm. because we feel like we, um, uh, we facilitate but we don't lead anything related to indigenous and if it's related to indigenous people, then the indigenous people should lead it. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to be meeting later on in the show with some of the indigenous people uh, who are on these committees, and they'll talk to us about what their role is in this mm -hmm. and how they, they lead the discussion and they lead the agenda and how they work with these newcomers to make sure that the right information is getting out there. And I also want to say that if, if our goal, our objective, is to create a welcoming, fair, and inclusive society and neglect to engage or bring the build the bridge the necessary bridge between the newcomers or the rest of the society with the indigenous people then we are we are not doing our job we right. cannot we cannot achieve our objective without connecting with the indigenous people here in this city and making sure that our objective is being achieved by creating this welcoming fair and inclusive society yeah, yeah. i like this okay this is a good time for us to take a break when we come back we're going to be joined by Two newcomers who sit on these boards that uh, Hani had talked about. We are going to have a chance to meet with them. Uh, and we will be looking at uh, multicultural Winnipeg and uh, the understanding the ties to Canada's history and the modern day problems that Indigenous people face. Stay with us. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Hello 
everyone. Welcome back. We're going to go to social media now to hear what some of you are saying about misconceptions and stereotypes newcomers to Canada are taught or see here. Let's go to our first question. What stereotypes or misinformation have you helped a newcomer to overcome regarding Indigenous people? We have this response from Josh Morin. Not that all Indigenous people are the same, and we are very much a diverse and unique population. Laurie Barnard says, we are not all drunks on welfare. Many more of us are highly educated and work as professionals in the community. We've, this is when we've, we're all familiar with this stereotype. Question two, what's happening in your community that to, or to build bridges between Indigenous people and newcomers to Canada, or what should be happening? We've got History Minion says, the Calgary Public Library has started having Indigenous speakers to their newcomer programs, so should other libraries. I like that. And we've got Josh Morin again, who says, the team I'm with has been facilitating blanket exercises to the junior high and high schools in St. Albert, Sturgeon Creek region. So there's, there's some stuff happening elsewhere, not just in Winnipeg. But we're going to get to some more with my guests, wondering about uh, if there's what, what, if there, the program here that seems to be working, if it's going to expand uh, to other places. But first, if you would like to add your opinion to the topics of conversation here, here is how you can. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus, and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. And I'm still joined here by Hani Atan Alubedi. He's the Community Engagement Coordinator for Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. This organization, among other things, works to build bridges between newcomers and Indigenous people to better foster relationships. And also joining us are two newcomers. Uh, Ileana Angelova was born in Bulgaria, immigrated to Canada in 2007. She sits uh, on the Immigration, par or Immigration Partnership Winnipeg's Immigrant Advisory Board? Table. 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 <laughs> and we have Roxana Amitova. I said it right. Uh, she's a University of Manitoba political uh, science or studies master's student. She's writing her thesis on Indigenous newcomer relations, how recent Canadian newcomers can build stronger relationships with Indigenous people, and how newcomers can contribute to and participate in Indigenous reconciliation. Both she and Ileana uh, are uh, on various committees within in a, Immigrant Partnership Winnipeg. There's so, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of engagement. <laughs> Lots of engagement work. So thank you both for being here and joining uh, Hani and I. So I want to know, uh, first of all, where did you get the idea? Well, let's start at the very beginning. When you got here, I'll start with you, Leanne. What was your perception right off the hop of Indigenous people when you arrived? Um, I have no perception. The only perception may be um, was from books I read back in Bulgaria that were fiction books. Mm. So I read Vina too, and you know, uh, so uh, I had the impression of indigenous people being honorable, and, um, and that's all. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. And then when you got to Canada and you see, did you come to Winnipeg from Bulgaria? Yes. So the, uh, this is, Winnipeg has a large urban indigenous population. Yes. Did you, you know, when you thought of them as us as honorable, uh, when I say them, I mean people you mm -hmm. read about in fiction books, yes, right? Yes, Not real yes. us. Um, <laughs> when you get here and you see us, are you, did, you, did your perception change at all? Or did you wonder, hmm, is it what I was reading about in books back home? Um, well, I started building a realistic perception. So it was a little bit different. And I started working uh, in the North End Women's Center, which is situated in the North End mm -hmm. uh, of Winnipeg. So uh, many of uh, the clients of the North End were uh, Women's Center were women, uh, Aboriginal, Indigenous women, uh, who were uh, struggling with family violence and uh, other barriers. So um, many of my colleagues were Indigenous. So uh, some of, m of them became my friends. I'm still friends with many indigenous uh, women and men. So uh, 
You got a crash course, like, really, yes. when you came here, just through your line of work, coming here yes. and being just immersed in yeah. North End Winnipeg and working in the field that you were working in, helping yeah. people in those situations. So, yes. But you must um, see, from other newcomers to Canada, you're very involved in, mm -hmm. in this organization, you must see and hear um, from other people that there's pretty quickly a ne negative stereotype yes. that happens when newcomers get here. We'd watched, uh, I think when you guys were in the green room, you would have seen the same thing. There was a news story about within two weeks, oftentimes, n people fresh to Canada have this really horrific take on what Indigenous people are all about, particularly in Winnipeg. And do, have you seen some of that firsthand yes, in your time uh, here? Yes. As uh, Han before mentioned, uh, some of my friends, when I was looking for a home, they would say, uh, North End is like a no-go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't even look there. And uh, uh, yeah, and then you also see uh, that many of the people who live in poverty and clearly are on the streets mm -hmm. also um, look like Aboriginal? I still don't understand. I think, uh, like, I, I can't recognize who's Aboriginal, who's not. Yeah. And, like, we're all people, and we're all different. Yes. <laughs> yeah, some of so. us aren't as obviously Aboriginal in appearance as yeah. others are. But, yeah. you, but you did associate, and you know other newcomers who associate, oh, yeah. that, the poverty. Poverty, That's indigenous crime, people, crime. Addictions, yes. Yes, yeah. And, Roxana, when did you come to Canada? Where did you come from? Uh, I came from Kazakhstan, which is in Central Asia, and I came here when I was 12, so I knew absolutely nothing about indigenous people, right. but I did learn misconceptions about them through my friends, through social media, and my friends were um, born here in Canada. Um, so my perception of indigenous people um, was, for a very quite a while, was very negative, mm -hmm. and it took me a while to realize and to learn that the things that they were teaching me were not correct. And that's why I'm doing my master's in indigenous, on indigenous people, partly because I want to take that education into my own hands and finally begin learning more about indigenous people and mm -hmm. what the truth it really is. I think that's interesting because we, Hani and I, had discussed that a lot of times it's the communities, these ethno communities mm -hmm. that are embracing, welcoming newcomers, that that's where the misinformation is getting passed on from. It's from right. within those cultures. And you're saying, yep, it was just regular old Canadians is where you got your dose. And sorry, how old were you when you... When you Twelve. Yeah, so I mean, that's your, your, what your peers say is gospel at that age, of course. Mm, yes. So what got you interested in getting involved? I mean, you're, you're doing your thesis on this, that's one thing, but you're, you're sitting at tables looking and going, let's build bridges. Mm -hmm. What made you want to take, you're a young woman, you, you, know, you think of a lot of other things that you could be doing, and this is something important enough for you to take time out to do, so why is that? Sure, well, partly because I see people who were born here in Canada, and it seems like they know absolutely not or very little about indigenous people. And I finally wanted to, uh, they spread all of these misconceptions to newcomers. And I wanted to um, educate myself so that I can go out into my own community, into other immigrant communities and teach them what indigenous people are like and to get them to come uh, together with indigenous people and talk to each other as opposed to about each other mm -hmm. in their sort of separate um, sections. And why do you think it's important? I think it's important because all of us live together in one city. It's not a very large city. We do uh, come in contact with each other quite often mm -hmm. um, in, here in downtown, but also in other spaces like universities. And it's, I don't think it's appropriate, especially in, in this day and age, to have these misconceptions about indigenous people um, because the majority of them, all of them, are completely incorrect. Mm. Um, and indigenous people are so much more than what so many newcomers think they are. Well, and there's, there's a, a portion of the discussion, I guess, needs to go back to when you see this poverty, which is connected to crime, which is connected to oftentimes addictions or mm -hmm. family dysfunction, that there's, you see it today, but it's rooted in the history. And, it, you know, mm -hmm. coming from another country, you probably don't know that history. Is that part of the work that you do? Eliana, it's, uh, have you, I mean, you've served on these, these boards too, trying to bridge these communities and gaps. Is there a growing sense of what the history is and how it connects to the modern day problems that people are encountering? Um, I would say that there is a growing knowledge of the history, mm -hmm. uh, like at least like from what I've seen from my friends around me. And uh, people often, you know, like you need a personal story to understand and to uh, mm -hmm. learn. 
uh, just like listening to the histories and like without the face mm -hmm. is, is different. So when some of my friends encounter me and like or, uh, say, say something that they shouldn't have said about an Aboriginal, or the, yeah, the indigenous people as a whole, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, so my friend, you know, and I mentioned the name of, the friend, of my friend who's indigenous, like, so is she like that? And no. Okay, and how about this friend? Is she like that? Mm -hmm. No. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, like you need to put a face, mm -hmm. and not just be abstract. Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 I think that the pictures that have been uh, shown uh, and on TV and uh, in other public media of uh, the little children in the residential schools. Mm -hmm. So the like that's how you get to people. Yeah. Honey, is there, you've seen this from the, from the birth till the present of mm -hmm. these, these groups working together. Yeah. What, what sort of an evolution have you witnessed? So I think if we go back to what Eliana and also Roxana mentioned is personalizing the, the abstract and the, the historical events mm -hmm. that took place centuries ago. This is what we see here is a product of centuries of, 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 um, trauma and intergenerational trauma, residential schools, and the rest of it. The newcomer, when they come here, for two reasons they would not have the, 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 the time and the capacity to digest this large picture, yeah. is one is because they are dealing with their own basic settlement needs. And mm -hmm. two is because it is kind of, you need to make that connection for them to pay attention to these kind of segments of history. So that's why we come in into the picture through our organization and create a short-term goals of engagement and this getting uh, a forum set up where the newcomer and indigenous people come in together and then put face to the story and allow both communities to tackle the same concerns mm -hmm. and to say okay so this is what I know about you but that's what you offered me now and th for that reason I feel it is false and it is myth it is not mm -hmm. fact so what Eliana is referring to, actually, we are doing it uh, through our forums, which is we chose to have two forums yearly, mm -hmm. and that's where specifically for indigenous and a newcomer ethnoculture community members to come together and share these concerns and also celebrate the commonalities that exist between two communities. Mm -hmm. The second forum that is coming up on November 17 is specifically dedicated for treaties. What does it mean to be we are we are all treaty people. What mm -hmm. does that mean? That's with including newcomers and their responsibility towards um, the indigenous people and the rest of the society. Right. And also there's one essential thing is missing here. If Canada is an amazing country to live in, there's one amazing part that is missing and that is knowing more about the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Our amazement of this country would be more celebrated if we include that part. If we know more about it, we deserve to know more about it. Right. And I think that is missing for now, but we're working towards that goal. Is there um, a feeling that I'm new to Canada, and if there's problems between Canada and Indigenous people, that's not that predates me? Yes. Is there some of that? That is that is true. And uh, some people saying I'm still unpacking my luggages. I'm yeah. coming here yeah. as a newcomer. And you're telling me about residential schools, you're telling me about intergenerational trauma, you're telling me that this is our responsibility. Mm. What does it all mean? We are all treaty people. The well, that's is, how to get the conversation back into it. Like, you are, you're here now, yes. you are a treaty person. It's that's like right. everybody else. So that's how you, I guess, bring everybody back into the, it is that your is history. Right. Now that you're here, this is your history as well. Once you break th through the first barrier, and that is saying, okay, it is not, you're not responsible directly to what had happened mm -hmm. to indigenous people, but you are responsible for the reality of today since you're a citizen of this country right. and a community member, and I think you deserve to know. And instead of staying in the darkness of ignorance, mm -hmm. you need to come to the light of education and awareness so you can be a better citizen. To, you need to be informed of, in the environment in which you live. And so for that, when you ignite that interest and curiosity in in, the, in the newcomers, you find them very responsive. So far, our experience with the newcomer population in the city that we reached out to, to engage them in these activities, it's extremely positive, mm -hmm. and we have very well attended gatherings, mm -hmm. and we move on towards bigger and bigger, larger projects, include the Indi Indigenous Orientation Toolkit and the celebration of its completion. I'm going to come and ask yeah. you about the Indigenous tool Orientation Toolkit in a second. You were going to say something in the midst there. I want to give you your chance before we hear about this toolkit that's 
I've, I've never heard of one of them mm -hmm. before, so it's pretty exciting. Just uh, it resonated with me what Hani said. Uh, like when I came here, I came to start a new life. So I kind of don't try not to look too much in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I didn't even come from like a lot of trauma, but like a lot of refugees and other, other immigrants are coming after uh, living a life full of trauma. So they want to put this back and they don't want to think of history. But that's, and, and, and they think, I thought that residential schools are in the history. So like we live in the now, but that's again not the case because the now, to, to live in the now, you have to appreciate the history as well. Yeah, that does make sense though. When you flee trauma, you don't want to come and embrace somebody else's trauma first thing when oh you yeah. get here, right? There would be, there should be that commonality, but I can see that it might take a little bit of time for you to mm. settle in and, and feel well enough that you could find the common ground of that trauma. We have a caller here now, I'm told. Uh, Ivan, he is from Croatia. He's been in Canada for seven months. Hello, Ivan. Hi, hi. How are you? Good, you? I'm great, thank you. So w welcome to Canada. Um, Thank you. What is, you've been here for seven months. What's your first consp uh, uh, feeling, thoughts about uh, Indigenous people since you've been here in Winnipeg for seven months? First of all, uh, I heard back, back home, I heard a lot of things, bad things about Indigenous people, mostly that I, there are a lot of them, it's on the drugs, and uh, a lot of them, it's on the welfare, uh, a lot of crime about indigenous people and when I came here I have seen that basically it's true but it's not all of them the same right so it's some of them are good some of them are some of them are let's say bad I mean they they have they have problems and that's usually so do you understand, in the seven months you've been here, it's a fairly short amount of time, do you understand where some of those problems are rooted? Uh, I understand, so, but uh, I live my life and that's it. Have you had encounters with some indigenous people in the time you've been here that, um, that people who have become your friends, your acquaintances, people you work with, that well, you enjoy my ex with? Well, my ex-roommate, uh, he's, uh, he's a journalist of APTN, and I'm good with him. My co-worker, he's uh, indigenous, he's native, he's Greek. I don't have any problems. So basically, uh, my contact with indigenous people are, are good. It's not bad. So it's well, only it's what good. I have seen on the street. So there's been a little bit of an evolution in, in the short time that you've been here. From these are people you completely want to stay away from to uh, there's a lot of really amazing people just like you or I who uh, you know work, uh, live their life and are just good people to be friends with and in your case live with. Yeah. Awesome. Ivan, I'm so happy you took the time to give us a call. That's amazing. Yeah. We're going to have to go to a commercial break. You take care, Ivan. Okay, we need to take another break, but when we come back, a citizenship judge who's taking education into her own hands and two Indigenous Winnipeggers working with newcomers set the records, to set the record straight about Indigenous Canada. And welcome back. In case you're just joining us, we're talking about the lack of information that greets newcomers to Canada and the lack of information that can lead to stereotypes, bad first impressions, lack of knowledge about how Canada's history with Indigenous people can still be seen today in many negative ways. Suzanne Carrier is a Cree Métis French, uh, Cree Métis French Canadian citizenship judge. She has presided over 30 citizenship ships ceremonies she's taken on uh, educating people before they can even take their oath. I'd like you to watch this. And it's important that we honor the shared history of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in this country and that we all build an understanding of how that shared history has shaped our present. This is especially important now as all Canadians are moving forward on the path to reconciliation. Well, Senator Murray Sinclair, who was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he said this about it. He said, reconciliation turns on a very simple concept. I want to be your friend and I want you to be my friend. 
And I think that explanation is just beautiful in its simplicity because the word reconciliation can sound a bit loaded or complex or we're not quite sure what we can do as individuals to achieve it. But the concept of friendship, I think, is one that we can all understand. Those who work with newcomers say for many, the first encounter with Indigenous people is often in impoverished and crime-fueled neighbourhoods, and they're quick to form opinions. I feel like if I say things, it's just, it's, it's bad things, not good things about it. Duncan is kind of very scary. Some, some of them could be like seen as dangerous and stuff like that. But for these people about to become Canadian citizens, Judge Suzanne Carrier is quite the opposite. She's Indigenous and holds their future in her hands. She's welcoming and warm to each and takes the opportunity to get these excited new Canadians to think differently about their relationship with Indigenous people. But I strongly encourage all of you to think about how you might be a friend and what you might do to advance that friendship. Whether that's in your community, in your workplaces, in your homes, what have you. Because here's the thing, you might not feel very connected to the history of Indigenous people in this country, but if you feel in any way connected to the future of this country, and I know you do because I could see it on your faces this morning, then we need to care about reconciliation. And besides, let's face it, unless you're a member of the First Nations, we all came from somewhere else. We're all immigrants. And we don't share the same past, that's a given, but we all share the same future, and that future is Canada. That's some good stuff there. Well, we'd hope to have Judge Carrier join us, but she's in Brandon today doing two more citizenship ceremonies. But we are joined by Wyeth Crouchy, who serves on Winnipeg's Indigenous and Newcomers Engagement Sector table, and Jennifer Chartrand, a member of Immigration Partnership Winnipeg's Indigenous Consultation Circle. Both are Métis and working with newcomers to build bridges. Correct? We still Correct. have, Hon Honey is still here too. Uh, now I want you guys to tell me about what it was that you, just tell me some of the most common things that you encounter when you meet with newcomers, uh, pertaining to perceptions of Indigenous people. Uh, just lack of awareness and I think there's a lot of uh, need for pre-boarding and I think there's, when they enter Canada, there's really no education being presented um, before they come to Winnipeg or mm -hmm. to Canada itself. So I don't think there's any awareness of Indigenous peoples and if, when there is awareness it's generally coming from stereotypical views or misinformation. Mm -hmm. So that's generally the basics of what I ever, whatever I encounter. Yeah, Jennifer, what's... what's what yeah, I would say that, that that's what I've encountered as well and just being in several different spaces both within my family and also just like in my social groups and, and university is one thing in school. It's just something that, that's always been a theme across my life. And like, I'm also like, Anishinaabe as well, and I'm Métis on one side. And I think that I have a unique experience of mm -hmm. being um, from two different groups who have different cultural identities, and right. yet it's very homogenized by Canadian society. And so that also happens to newcomers as well. So oftentimes we think that they've all experienced the same thing, but really mm -hmm. they come from so many different places. And so that's kind of like a bridge part right there that we can build immediately. The mm -hmm. other piece is that when I see discrimination, it's, it's often being said in front of me just because people make the assumption that someone that mm -hmm. would be Indigenous isn't around them. And so mm -hmm. you have to step in and be that, that person who makes that correction. And it's a, hard, right. it's a hard line to walk, for sure. Well, I have an eight-year-old son who was asking me today what this show was about. And when I explained to him, he said, well, but people who are new to Canada, but are, there's lots of people that are racist against them and think bad things that aren't true. And I said, right. right. And he says, well, then they can't think bad things and racist things about <laughs> indigenous people, that's yeah. not right. And of course in the mind of an eight-year-old it makes completely no sense, but it's realistic. This mm -hmm. is, it, right. it does go both ways. So what got you guys involved? What do you, what, what was it hoping, or what were you hoping to be able to change? Just leave it open to either one of you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess what I was hoping to change is that, I guess I ha my experience is that I'm a young person from an indigenous background who doesn't know my language, um, who has had my family teach me so much of my culture and that's been so, like that's enriched my life and gave me a sense of identity and purpose, but that wasn't reflected in my education necessarily. And so even though I got these little pieces of it, um, I think that what made me really passionate about this project is that I think that that's an identity that I could possibly share with newcomers and I think they might feel the same way, where you're kind of walking the line between two different two different groups. Like, this is your identity now. Is this where you came from? Mm -hmm. And also as a Canadian. And so you're constantly 
trying to maybe reconcile those two places. So you, you have reconciliation within yourself, and then you also have it as w in your community as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind okay. of how I feel about it. Well, and two, it's an opportunity. I mean, you could look at it like this. We, the numbers that you were giving me, honey, is that it's 300,000 refugees and immigrants that come to Canada right. every year. You kind of look and go, well, that's 300,000 potential new racists. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. so you could, I mean, that's how I would look at it and think maybe if I could get in on the ground floor and, and help yeah. this new Canadian identity that they're going to be forming, be formed properly because we already have uh, our fair share of ignorant yeah. Canadians born on this soil. Right. You know, we don't need to be adding to those numbers. So yeah. why did you get involved? What did you hope to accomplish? Well, just from my background, I'm an instructional designer, so I was hoping to maybe develop some programs that are accessible to a lot of people in a way that, because um, there's a lot of content out there that I think is, is very complicated and very legal focused, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's somewhat unaccessible to the layman. So if there's maybe resources that are easily accessible via like digital media or just pamphlets, any, any way to access it easily, mm -hmm. I think that would be a benefit for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, just having that library of content and making it consistent with the with a consistent language, consistent message, and um, being vetted with a group of people that is, you know, it's going to be accurate, mm -hmm. and you know it's coming from a central source of many minds, pursuing the goal of having it open mm -hmm. and uh, creating a dialogue for yeah. people and having it accessible, basically. Well, and see, sitting around with people and seeing and and seeing them as humans that sit at the same table as right. you that you have these conversations with that alone is is knocking down a big barrier right totally. Totally. these aren't it's, it's not us versus them anymore no. they and we it's it's us right yeah. mm -hmm. i wanted to well, somebody had touched on the lack of uh, education that that you get before you come here with regards to indigenous people even once you're here and you want to go for your citizenship i was doing a little bit of research and found there's a study guide for when mm. you're going to take your citizenship test and i want to read a, a portion uh, and ask you, my, the indigenous pe people on the panel here, if this is enough. So I'm going to read here. It's a little, it's a little long-winded, but it's not bad. So bear with me. So Aboriginal people, this, this is in the study guide. It's titled Aboriginal Peoples. It's a section that's about this big. When Europeans explored Canada, they found all regions occupied by native peoples they called Indians because the first explorers thought they had reached the East Indies. The native people lived on the land, some by hunting and gathering, others by raising crops. The Huron and that of the Great Lakes region, like the Iroquois, were farmers and hunters. The Cree and Dene from the Northwest were hunters and gatherers. The Sioux were nomadic, following the bison, buffalo herds. The Inuit lived off the Arctic wildlife. West Coast natives preserved fish by drying and smoking. Warfare was common among Aboriginal groups as they competed for land, resources, and prestige. The arrival of European traders, missionaries, soldiers, and colonists changed the way that natives lived forever. Large numbers of Aboriginals died of European diseases to which they lacked immunity. However, Aboriginals and Europeans formed strong economic, religious, and military bonds in the first 200 years of coexistence, which laid the foundations of Canada. So there you go. That's all you need to know to become a Canadian <laughs> citizen. It's all, it's so simple. It's sweet. It's lovely. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's mm -hmm. all fairly okay. I mean, when I read that, I just went. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, uh, what do you guys think of that? That's what, that's what we're teaching people yeah. who, who want to become Canadian citizens. That's sure. it. Yeah, I think language is such a huge component of this conversation, and it's just mm -hmm. how we speak about this issue. And I think sometimes people are afraid to say certain things. Mm. And I think that that's maybe a barrier to why we're having all these misunderstandings. And so I think that one of the things, just saying like coexisting and, and, and talking about these, these terms, it paints a picture where maybe things weren't necessarily as volatile as they were. Mm. And to, to provide that truth provides people with perspective and the perspective that they need to understand the situation wholly. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot more that could have been said, absolutely. And it just building empathy, you have to do that by beginning with the truth. Yeah, and that's so a little over, counts. you would agree, a little oversimplified? I think it's, yeah. I think indigenous people Perhaps even inaccurate? <laughs> yes, I think indigenous peoples deserve more than two paragraphs yeah. to be, you know, description. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think there's a lot more back history. I think there's even more, more importantly, a lot of current issues stemming from that history yeah. that people need to know about. And I don't think that's given any focus in, in a lot of academic in institutions these days. And no. even coming into Canada, I don't know um, 
if there's any educational uh, awareness or if there's other resources available for people, if they are motivated to look into it, mm -hmm. where do they get that information? I don't think it's easily accessible. Well, honey, it's going to be easily accessible for some newcomers. You are working on uh, an Indigenous orientation kit. I want to know what this is. So for the reasons that you mentioned earlier, the lack of knowledge, ignorance, easy to access stereotypes, misconceptions, and develop, it may develop into racist, dis discriminatory behavior on an individual level or a community level, mm -hmm. and it created problems to the community at large. We found this is a gap needs to be addressed. The best way to address it is through a proper and efficient and sufficient education. It's not only through paragraphs, for example, but we need to know as a newcomer, I would like to see the concept of shared land. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people shared their land in the beginning and they still share in the land mm -hmm. through the treaties and others. This is absent and what it means in reality and what it means in, in, simplest, in, in, in simplified terms, these are the things that newcomers would like, I think it would need to know. And so the orientation toolkit that we aim to have is going to cover all aspects of the history. So pre-colonial, post-colonial, family unit, cultural basis, like what does it mean to have a culture and a culture, diverse culture within mm -hmm. the indigenous um, people. And also um, there is a section for commonalities, there is resurgence of culture, mm -hmm. and all these things it need to be um, detailed in, in, in a way that it give that richness that is missing in those two paragraphs or beyond those two paragraphs. And this will be, in your, in your idea, it would be to have, you know, whether you're fresh off the boat or plane, you get this, here you go, welcome to Canada. Here's our, your orienta Indigenous Orientation Toolkit to get you on the right. Our goal is this, to become available throughout the settlement sector. So that means if someone arrives here, today. Anywhere in Canada? Anywhere in Winnipeg. We okay. start in Winnipeg. We'll that's start our, in Winnipeg. That's <laughs> our mandate. Our <laughs> mandate is Winnipeg. <laughs> so we start with Winnipeg and hopefully the rest of Canada will copy. Mm -hmm. But we start with Winnipeg and Winnipeg would, if I arrive today, if I'm expected to sit and listen about how I access my banking account and if I, there is a problem I go to the police and how I call them and all that, I also want to know there is something called indigenous people and indigenous cultures and that's the information available and hopefully within a very, like within the first month of their arrival, this orientation should be available and delivered by indigenous people. So we, the idea is to have indigenous trainers to train settlement front line, mm -hmm. liners and also the newcomers themselves. And then beyond the settlement sector, we go to the faith-based groups and the rest of the community. But we will start with those two groups, the settlement sector, mm -hmm. the faith-based groups, and to the orientation, the Indigenous Orientation Toolkit will be delivered by Indigenous trainers. And this isn't, so this isn't just a little baggie that you get when you show no. up that's got some pamphlets in it that go right into your recycling. This is a, <laughs> this is a sit down and we cover all of these bases yes. and it's Indigenous led, it's Indigenous people who are, have these little consultation meetings with all the newcomers that come to Winnipeg. There's, you had mentioned that you have there's other organizations, sister organizations, I think you called them, we throughout have, Canada. We have partners that are working on this project, and the partners are Kairos Canada, Manso, which is Manitoba Service Organizations um, of Settlement. It's a very long title, <laughs> if I put it in the right order. And also, it's, uh, you got with Treaty Relations Commissions to partner with us, mm -hmm. and the University of Manitoba um, Community Service Learning through the Department of Native Studies. Is there going to be, so can we, can we expect to see this, this, this toolkit being adopted in other places where people will have, you know, Edmonton for example, Regina I would think for example would be other right. good places mm -hmm. where there's a large population of indigenous people who are there and then newcomers too. Mm -hmm. Is that planned? I, I think once we succeed with that here in Winnipeg, I don't see why others sh not to copy this experience or to add on it and to make mm -hmm. it more successful mm -hmm. in their own settings. So yes, we will make it available to everyone that can make use out of it. Mm -hmm. And we'll make it accessible to every people that need to educate their own community members or their um, members from whether it's a faith groups or as I said, settlement sectors or service mm -hmm. providers, we will make it available. So quickly, the goal is education. Quickly, I want to ask both of you, what do you think of this Indigenous Orientation Toolkit? I think it's a fantastic idea. I think, I think it's necessary. I think that maybe the barriers that we're facing are really more just logistical. And then the interest, I think, 
is there from what we've seen and that's been really exciting for me just to mm. see that people are, are interested to learn more they just haven't found like a way that maybe isn't you know a little bit hard to jump over those first hurdles to get the information so to have like really basic conversations with people that's just the first start and I think that this is a mm. way to do it I think the follow-up is really important yeah. um, how you know the citizen citizenship process will check in on how they've come far uh, through that so you know how, how is the indigenous toolkit going you know and like that being a major part of the you know I guess the procedure yeah, yeah. and add to it and evolve it as it's yes. going yeah. exactly. I'm being told we are out of time it's easy to lose track of time when you're <laughs> talking about interesting things here that is all the time though we have for today thanks to all of my guests and to you for watching at home and who took the time to call or tweet this episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptnnews.ca backslash podcast if you've missed any of the shows and you want to catch up you can check out our website aptnnews.ca next week cannabis is becoming legal and we will be putting the cannabis industry in focus please join us next wednesday i'm melissa ridgen see you next week